Welcome to the Mystic Fool's Journey podcast. I'm Anna and this is Ruth. Howdy. And this is an occult history podcast. And today we're taking a deep dive into amulets and talisman. So let's dive on in. Just to like preface everything, I keep wanting to say talesman. (laughs) Hey, that's fine. You know, it's like, I feel like there was a TV show called Tailspin when I was younger. Oh, really? Like that. Yeah, that sounds like some. I feel like there was like a a fox, and like literally, like he could fly with his tail. I might be making that up, but we'll know what you mean. At least you prefaced it. (laughs) Yeah, for sure. So just know if I accidentally do it, I know that I'm wrong. It's just still stuck in my brain. That's fine. (laughs) (laughs) So before we dive into the history of amulets and talisman, I think it'd probably be beneficial to us all to like just chat a little bit about the actual definitions of the words. Because it seems like there's a whole bunch of, like, different dealios going on around, like, figuring out what's an amulet and what's a talisman and, like, what distinctions between them are. And it actually, like, took us all, like, as a society a long time to, like, decide what was what. I think, like, we were still debating it until, like, the late 1800s. It kind of, like, kept flip-flopping, too. It's not like the people back in the day had, like, a strict rule about what was an amulet or a talisman. It, like, Mm -hmm. evolved. We'll find, as you'll see in this episode, <laughs> yeah, it right. evolved over time. It was very much like, it's not like it was like clear cut from the beginning anyways. It just kept building. Yeah, for sure. And figuring out all of that involves like a whole bunch of Latin, which we all know that Anna is an expert in Latin. So I'm just going to not mention the Latin stuff so I don't embarrass myself in front of her. I've never taken a Latin class in my life. <laughs> I've never <Yeah>. done that. <laughs> not right. a thing. <laughs> so if you flip through dictionaries and encyclopedias trying to nail down what amulet and talisman really mean, it's like a word swap game. They're always calling one the other and vice versa. Greek and Latin have this crazy variety with over like 40 different ways to talk about a talisman. And guess what? When you dig through into the, like all the scholarly studies on this stuff, it's the same exact deal. People categorize these things in a bunch of different ways. And sometimes it's all about the shape or material Other times it's the inscription or how it's worn, whether around the neck or even like slung around the chest. But uh, we're going to be referring back to a lot of work of some scholars with a capital S to break it down even further. And I guess we should mention, we like read a book about this. So we should probably literally call. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's a book. It's called Amulets and Talisman. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. It's by a Frenchman, Claude Le Coutu. I apology, apologies, Claude. But High Magic of Talisman and Amulets is a really good book. So go read that if you want to know more about this. It's very in depth. I will say the first portion is like a lot of lists of what amulets were used like back in the day. Like mm-hmm. so it's not I it's not like full of stories and tales that'll like capture your imagination. But if you're like, I wanna see some solid lists of what people were using, it has those. <laughs> it definitely yeah, has it that. has lists, it has the origins of words, you know, that whole thing. If that's your gist, then go and go ahead and dive in. But anyways, all these scholars, they break it down even further. So the amulet is like this natural or like a barely worked thing that's got some built in protective vibes. And then the talisman is one where they whip up in like a magical lab, like it's manufactured for a specific purpose. And then there's the pentacle, which is like a fancier version of the talisman, mm. which is all evolved biscuits. Yeah, I know. What's biscuits doing. She's like, why are you up so early? <laughs> right. Why are you in bed? Uh, and so, um, yeah, I wanted to dive a bit more into the pentacles, but then you have to talk about like the characters and like it just gets to be a lot pretty fast. Yeah, it gets pretty complicated because you'll see because amulets are like the simplest version and then you have talisman and then you have pentacles, which I think, if I remember correctly, like we're used a lot in like the Lima with yeah. um, our friend Alistair Crowley, but they get even more in depth in terms of like when you need to do things, what kind of like inscriptions and carvings need to go on it and like the characters being like what is carved on it, like the letters or symbols. And yeah, it gets intense. <laughs> It does. And today we've kind of settled on the general idea that amulets are like rocks or things hanging off of you with like no fancy signs or pictures. And talismans, though, they fall into the category of like decked out objects with artificial marks. So it's kind of whether or not people kind of have a hand in crafting them. Mm -hmm. Uh, I guess in simpler terms, it's like saying amulets just work on their own, doing their thing with like their built in powers. And talismans on the flip side get a boost from like some human magic action. 
people do their mystical thing to give like the object serious power. Oh yeah, we'll get into it. There's definitely like talisman are all about like pulling in the energy and powers of other <laughs> things by like through ritual for the most part yeah exactly so back in the day around like the first century bce this latin word amuletum made his Heck debut yeah. in this dude varro's work which i guess he's like a roman scholar i'm pretty sure he is like an emperor and if i'm right i'm pretty sure he was like a really famous emperor like five five emperors that were like really dope is that right was, oh boy uh is this marcus Terentius varro Do yes you, yes yeah. okay yeah so he was a polymath and a prolific author and apparently he was regarded as rome's greatest scholar we're not oh, gonna cool. get like too in depth into him but yeah you know he's one of those like well, I guess what we might call a renaissance man, which is like a, a person who can like do everything. You know, they're, <laughs> like, they're like, yeah, I'm going to dabble in war strategy, but I'm also going to be really great in the arts or in philosophy. You know, like they do a little bit of everything and they're great at it. <laughs> That's kind of what that man, is. Man, what a douchebag. I mean, he's got a pretty long Wikipedia page, so. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, but this word, it comes from the verb amoliri, amoliri. Let's say, let's go with that, meaning to drive away or to protect. And basically, it's like a tag for things that are like supposed to keep you safe, like a lucky charm you might carry around, whether it's like a little figure or a metal or maybe even a seal. Seals are pretty popular. And it's got this rev for preventing all sorts of troubles from like illnesses and accidents to accidents. Accidents. Yeah, you have to work out. Watch out for those accidents. That's they're the next level accidents, <laughs> right? And even uh, like evil spells. So then you fast forward to like 14th century in France, and they started throwing around the word amulet. With I guess uh, now that we're realizing that we're making a podcast and they can't see the spelling of the word, it's just like e t t e. That's the ending. Yeah, like the name Annette, how it ends in an e t t e. Yes. So like we're saying amulet and amulet. But it's like one has the more <laughs> feminine spelling at the end. And exactly. It's it's French. Yeah. Amulet. Yeah. It's the feminine version of the word. And it took until 1877 for the French Academy to decide its grammatical gender. So talk about a late call. <laughs> I, yeah, I definitely did like a little Google search because I was like, what? how do you decide? Because we speak English, which doesn't give genders to anything. Um, but a lot of the Romance languages and Latin languages, like you have genders for objects that make you're like a pencil is masculine you're like why <laughs> why, why but why there's like a lot of criteria i was like oh maybe i can like toss in a little tidbit about like how we choose genders in these <laughs> mm -hmm. like gendered languages and i was like no we don't have time for this <laughs> i was looking yeah, at it, it's right like, here's three criteria most of the time words meet all three sometimes just some of the three i was like i can't even i was like that's a whole different podcast for a different genre of audience probably people who love like linguistics is, is what that's for yeah exactly and um i mean i don't know anything about that but i would like to know as well like why why do things have genders i don't know we'll figure I, it out later maybe maybe we'll maybe it'll be a little another tangent <laughs> yeah right we'll, like, we'll figure it out yeah <laughs> or if you're a linguist a linguini a linguini, a linguini. if you're a linguini <laughs> then go ahead and write it to our email and let us know what's up <laughs> If you're a linguini, please tell us why linguist and linguini are so close together. And then tell us <laughs> why words have genders in certain right. languages. Exactly. Oh, geez. I think instead of a linguist, I'll need like a speech therapist. <laughs> <laughs> so anyways, these things go by many, many names. Um, we've got like the African Greek, mm -hmm. and then the Christian relics, uh, scapulars and metals. Because apparently, like, all sacred relics are considered talismans. Yes, they are. Which was cool. <laughs> and uh, I did write a bit about that that I ended up deleting because of, you know, we talk about Christianity so, so many <laughs> it's times. It's okay. I'll cover a little bit of it. <laughs> okay, cool. <laughs> I think it's important to note just because, over as we've seen throughout so many episodes of this podcast, when a... Uh, large group of people come in with their ideals whatever that is it's yeah. going to affect the course of history and how things evolve over time and it's very similar to kind of when we talk about like 
herbs and rituals and how they evolved so it's like pagans could still do their thing in secret or like Christians adopted it because they couldn't get rid of it. That has happened with amulets as well. So it's Mm. still like an important part. We won't go super deep into it, but (laughs) there'll be a little bit more later on. Yeah, sounds good. Um, But then my favorite is the Egyptian scarab, which is like a beetle amulet and it's usually in ring form. I feel like Mm -hmm. we see that in pop culture all the time. Oh, it's everywhere. I mean, I feel like that's one of the few, that's one of the things that people have really latched on to because it's just so popularized at this point. Mm -hmm. Like, we have the classic hit, The Mummy, with Brendan Fraser. And yes. if you go through all those movies, like that in the 90s, really kicked off like another like Egypt craze. So now we have like yeah. the Beatles came, like the Scarab Beatles really came back. And that's just been like a very popular symbol throughout pop culture that has like endured for Egypt. For better or for worse, I don't know. <laughs> but it it was sacred and it was definitely considered to be an amulet. It had like its own inherent power, just as a beetle that's it didn't have to do anything to it yeah and apparently the romans brought it to uh the medieval west which made it kind of like a trendsetter oh yeah we know how the west aka europe <laughs> loved <laughs> loved to latch onto things from other countries they really did especially france with its whole like egypt file phase where they were just like anything from egypt i must have it <laughs> <laughs> yeah i just uh side note have you seen the new napoleon movie I have not. Did, have you should you? check it out. It's pretty good. There's a Is cute little like Egyptian scene that like pokes Ooh. fun at Napoleon's height. Anyway, it's fun. <laughs> it's a good movie. Cute. You should check it out. Okay. okay. <laughs> so Noted. some amulets are like your everyday good lucky charms, while others have like super special jobs. Like the hand of Fatima or is it Fatima? Fatima, right? I always said Fatima, but I don't. To be fair, I haven't looked it up and I'm. Sorry to anybody who speaks the language that this word comes from. Right. Yes. So suppose I always say the word. Sorry. No, <laughs> I, always say the, I always say the word in the way that sounds coolest. So that way yes. it's like at least I'm trying to pay respects in the only way I know how, which is like, this sounds beautiful if I say it this way. That's that's honestly it's a good move because at least it shows that you're trying. I just trying. say it in my normal, which I feel like <laughs> sounds like I'm being so disrespectful. But I really no. do. I do care. <laughs> I care. I want to know. Uh, so anyways, it supposedly gives you like the upper hand against the evil eye, especially in like this region of Maghreb. Yeah, which is the northwest region of Africa. It like encompasses several. I had to Google it. I was like, I've never oh. heard this term. Um, it's several countries like it includes Morocco, um, but several countries up in the northwest of Africa. In case cool. anybody did, in case anybody else didn't know, because we're all about learning. Clearly, on right? This podcast. Yes, no shame. <laughs> we are all about learning. Uh, so, anyways, let's dive into a bit more about like amulets first. And I'm so excited to introduce you to our first character, Pliny the Elder. Love that name. That's I know. Um... Apparently, he has his own beer that's still popular these days. Wait, that like came from him. You know, I didn't I didn't look too much into it, but when you Google Pliny the Elder, beer pops up after it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, interesting. You know, I'd love to believe that he invented a beer that still exists, but my bet is that some guy in the 80s decided to name a brand after him. Exactly. That's exactly what happened. Uh, so anyways, this dude was like the Wikipedia of ancient times. He gathered all the info and was super smart and an open-minded thinker and ranted nonstop about how, like, magicians were pulling a fast one on everyone around him. He really did not like magicians. Oh, my gosh. He called them. I mean, like, he really, like, he just straight up called them stupid. And he called people who, like, believed in what magicians did, like, rude names. He was just very, (laughs) he was very straight to the point about how much he didn't like magicians. And he's like, anybody who falls for this is an idiot. (laughs) That's so funny. Uh, so, uh, he talks about amulets, like, a bunch of times. He, like, wrote, like, a a whole compilation of texts. He wrote everything down. And so he talks about amulets a bunch of times and shows us that people back then used all sorts of random stuff for good luck. In Pliny's Natural History, his most well-known work, Mm -hmm. uh, the guy uses amulet less than ten times, throwing it around in, like, totally different situations. And we find out that, according to him, things like cyclamen root and basilisk blood could be used as amulets to ward off evil spirits and bats you know so if you have a bat problem maybe throw some basilisk blood in your attic 
that isn't a thing I normally would think would be an issue. We always try to encourage bats nowadays. Like we yeah. put bat boxes in like like in my house growing up, we had bat boxes in the neighborhood to like give them oh, homes. Oh, fun. Yeah, That's it's cool. like you don't think of that. You're like, we rarely see them and we want more of them to eat the bugs. So yeah, mosquitoes, they're good mos- mosquito preventers. They are. A uh, big bat doesn't want you to know this one trick about basilisk blood. <laughs> blood. <laughs> Clickbait for amulets. Sure, one right? one. <laughs> so scarab horns were like baby protectors, just like amber. You're supposed to hang around it, hang it around like their little necks, which I think we actually still do for different reasons. Don't isn't like amber necklaces help with teething or something? I don't know. I don't have a baby. <laughs> I don't. Ha- I'm not even gonna try on that one. I yeah. know that there are still some cultures where they hang essentially amulets um, from like the, they'll put like little bracelets around the baby to protect them from the evil eye. Um, one of my friends from El Salvador was telling me about it, where it's like most children in their culture will like have basically like an evil eye amulet to like, protect them. <laughs> it's just this like a little bracelet. Um, I don't know about the beetle horns or amber <laughs> if those are still you. Oh yeah, those baby those babies need some. If you're not getting scarab horns for your baby, <laughs> man, what are you doing? You should, I'm gonna call CVS on you. <laughs> oh my god. Uh, so get this. Pliny even says that spinning in your ur- urine or in your right shoe before putting it on, is also an amulet. Apparently, the concept isn't necessarily, like, about some fancy crafted object in general. You can kind of use whatever you'd like. That implies that, like, your spit has some sort of magical power. Well, mine does. And oh, that's right. why yes. we're going to be adding it to our online shop. So if you'd yes. like, you know, riches and fortune to come mm-hmm. your way, then buy my spit in a exactly. bottle. Ruth was fortunate enough to have scarab horns and amber hung around her neck as a child, so right. she has inherent magical powers. And Shout out, Mom. Her... Yeah, now we're going to sell her spit in a bottle. <laughs> <laughs> There's some people on OnlyFans that might pay good money for that. Right? I know. Many of our listeners are very familiar with crystals and the idea that certain crystals have specific powers or energy or affect things. So crystals would be, a, it's not even a modern version, it's just our something like in our pop culture that's still around that is an amulet Um, minerals were definitely still big back in the day there were kind of like three main categories of animal amulets plant amulets and then mineral amulets and Mm -hmm. the crystals have been around for a long time Um, we even see like examples of that in like scripture from the bible where it's like oh they put like the stones of the tribe on their armor as protection you're like okay there it is (laughs) we've got we got magic stones um, so it's all about like what's inherent to the pro- like the product or the ingredient. That's why we're making jokes about like Ruth spit being magical. <laughs> yes, <laughs> it's because uh, you know if your spit is magical, like an amulet, then that implies that your spit has some sort of inherent magical property that mm. would or supernatural property that would like protect you. So like you don't have to manipulate it or anything. Um, and then another like really common one, which like we've already mentioned, is like. The um the amulet, the evil eye amulet, usually called the Nazar amulet. I think everyone's familiar with like the big blue eye, <laughs> like yes. the dark blue, the white, the light blue. It looks like a big blue eye. And it's like it's not about the product that that amulet is made out of, like the eye itself. It's not like the glass is what's magical. It's the symbol itself is mm, magical. Right. It's like that is the thing. And so it's like you don't have to do any rituals or carvings or extra like woohoo stuff to like mm. make it magic. And so that's the point of an amulet. It's like, hey, this is just inherently magical and will protect you and you don't have to do anything else with it. It's like one and done. Like, you know, like set it and forget it. Crockpot of magic <laughs> items. Crockpot of magic items? Yes. <laughs> oh, crockpot. One day I should tell you about Ngongas. Those are Ooh. some crockpots of magical items. Let's put that on the list of podcasts. Truly, episodes. that would be that so is, fun. That is a trip. Uh, And then... Also, I see these evil eye symbols on everything. I was on Amazon the other day looking for some slippers, and I saw one that had the evil eye on the slippers. Yes. So I was yeah, like, I think, wow. I think my phone case actually has it. Like, I oh, like the design before it's, it, it's kind of It's kind of a play on it. This isn't like the exact one, but like usually mm-hmm. it's like just a perfect, cir- kind of like a blobby circle because it's yeah. usually made out of like molten glass. <laughs> but yeah, <laughs> they're everywhere now. Truly. So what Pliny or dude is saying 
is that amulets are all about protection and you could basically use like anything lying around to make one. You slap it on yourself, around the neck or a limb, and Pliny's favorite word for this is aldejar. Oh, I can't we'll even add adeligare. What adeligare? See, that's my that's my fake fancy. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, fake fancy for the win. I think you're right on the money there. I wish th- that's the problem with books, and maybe like Kindle or somebody has a feature for this. Is like I wish I could just click the word and like get the pronunciation. But I have only set, heard this, read this word. I've never said it out loud, so who knows? Anyways, so it means to bind or attach to. And in the Middle Ages, they went with jester, which means to carry. Amulets show off this mix of medical and magical know-how that magicians had back in the day. Knowledge about the hidden powers of, like, basically everything around us. So that was amulets wrapped up with a bow. Let's chat about talismans now. So talisman comes from the Arabic word tilsam, which, and it's basically just an object. It could be like a stone, a ring, or whatever that's got some like sacred signs on it. There's like a whole thing about characters and that sort of thing, but uh, it's a lot to jump into. So we'll just skim over that. People think it's got this like magical mojo, like protection and power. And the Arabic tilsam comes from the Greek telesma, which had a bunch of different meanings. For some folks, it's like a religious ceremony. For others, a ghost. Oh, interesting. <laughs> I know. that's. I was very interested when I heard that. Mm-hmm. And for some, it was even li- just like in general linked to like devilish stuff. The word tello means to bring to an end and teleturgia means the right. <laughs> so a talisman. <laughs> a mouthful for sure. It is. like and That's a very multifaceted word to go from like telesma. That means like three different very different things <laughs> yeah exactly i know it's interesting very different things like i understand how they're in the same like niche when you think about it but like a religious ceremony or a ghost like that's or a ghost <laughs> <laughs> but anyways a talisman seems to be an object that's been made holy probably through some ritual giving it this like legit magical power and back in the byzantine days people thought that these objects were like byzantine Byzantine? Byzantine. Byzantine yeah. days. That one I do know. That one yes. I do know. At least in like Western English. It, who knows how other people would prefer to pronounce it. <laughs> yeah, right. My uh, homeschool knowledge is showing through for sure on this episode. That's okay, though. <laughs> <laughs> no, no one should know any of this. This is not right? taught I know. in any school. We wouldn't like... know any of this if it wasn't for like Google. Exactly. Yeah. It's not common <laughs> knowledge. We'd like to pretend it is, but it's not. So people thought that these objects were like homes for demons and brought back in by some magical ceremony called the telete. When and this is the part we warned you where I was going to talk about a little bit <laughs> about Christianity. Just a right. little, just a touch, just a touch. So if you've been with us throughout the podcast, it should come as no surprise that when I say the church was constantly trying to forbid the use of both amulets and talismans, like it should not <laughs> surprise you. But um, there are Christian folks throughout history That considered, some considered like all amulets and talisman the work of demons or Satan. They're like, no, you're basically like trying to do what God does. You're trying to like harness powers that aren't from God or given to you. Like you're trying to do crazy things. So some people just thought it's all Satan (laughs) as usual. (laughs) And then at one point, the church tried to like even churchmen were still using relics and talisman. They were just like using gospel instead of you know, the other sigils or like zodiac signs, they were like writing scriptures on pieces of paper to hang around their neck or like they were creating essentially Christian amulets and talismans. Yeah. So like at some point it was like the church was like, okay, well, people are not not using these anymore, even though we're threatening excommunication. Um, Mm -hmm. So they tried to offer like Christian alternatives. Really? It was, yeah, it was one of those like, they're like, oh, you know, instead of using this amulet, just double your prayers or like use this or like so use the funny. sign of the cross or take communion you know seek confession and get help from like the holy men at your church they're just like there's other ways they're like trying to like offer up other options it's like no our stuff is just as good as your amulets <laughs> that's so funny yeah they tried to do a little like reverse marketing is what it seems like man they um, love to do that yeah pretty much they it happens 
so much. But that is how some of these traditions have actually survived over time, which I hopefully is yeah. a good thing. They're not like completely yeah. erased from history. For sure. Um, but yeah, of course, like it was like never super clear cut because um, there were, like we said, like some religious folk carrying around their own talisman um, <laughs> in order to protect them. But they just like skewed it. So it was sure. Christian stuff. Um, and so eventually the church was like, well, if we approve of the objects and the scriptures being used, then you can you can use these. It's totally fine as long as it's stuff that like the church deems as like holy and uh, of God. Uh. <laughs> so then they were like, OK, they started to like backpedal. They're like, just kidding. Like, as long as you're using like gospel, it's uh. totally fine. Or like as long as you're using like a piece of the true cross or you're using a relic of some kind, which Ruth mentioned earlier, relics are talisman. It's just. Yeah specific to the religion so in christianity it's often like the remains of a saint or martyr or things that they supposedly touched would be considered relics because they're now sacred objects within that Mm. particular religion so it's like hey as long as it's a relic you're carrying around we're good with it (laughs) have you ever like walked into a hobby lobby oh many times in my life where like everything has a bible verse on it all of it. Yeah. You know, I grew up in the South. So like yes. that was <laughs> my normal craft experience was going to Hobby Lobby and like right. everything was vaguely Christian or not so vaguely Christian. Right. And it wasn't until the, I left the South that I was like, oh, that's not normal in all craft stores. I know. Isn't this so funny? It just makes you think is like Hobby Lobby, like the number one hawker of like talisman in modern America. Oh, it might be. I mean, they're obviously like a Christian company like they constantly have like christian music playing i don't i would you know it'd be fun it's always fun to think that it's like oh there's a conspiracy hobby lobby is like the main way that people are spreading like christian relics or something like that but it probably doesn't go that deep it's probably just like cool we have an audience that's christian and we'll get a lot more money if we like support their beliefs that's for sure uh okay okay, so back on track (laughs) back on track sorry so talisman So here's the deal. A talisman can play the amulet game and vice versa. It's all about the size and how you use it. Take this example. The Chironides. We'll roll with that. I believe in you. Which is an ancient Greek text. It's a compilation of like magical and medical recipes. It's super cool. Um, But it says like carry around a vulture's beak and tongue and you're set for some like nighttime adventures and they'll scare off like demons and wild beasts and snakes and bad luck. Plus, they'll also hook you up with, like, victories, loads of cash, and all around, like, glory and honor. So the first part screams amulet, right? Like, it's just the raw materials, like, vultures, beak, and tongue. But then, like, the second part is all about, like, the talisman vibe, where it's, like, it the thing has a purpose. It's going to get you something. You know, it's working on your behalf, that sort of thing. Yeah, definitely. I, it definitely, it's like, hey, in addition to your flashlight, don't forget your <laughs> vulture's beak. <laughs> right? <laughs> Yeah, so there's, like, different levels of these amulets, I think, is we give you more examples, which is why it's, like, so confusing over time, is that, like, there's simple amulets, like we talked about, like, rocks. Mm. This rock does a thing. You can carry it. Great. That's a simple amulet. Uh, and another example is, like, according to this book, the Herbarium of Pseudo Apuleos from the 4th century, apparently, like, carrying, like, the plant verbena will protect you from snake bites. Cool. So- somehow. But then there's compound amulets, which is where you like combine two materials together to enhance their properties. Still not a talisman. So like amulet, simple amulet, one thing. Compound amulet, two things. Then there's complex amulets, which start to combine multiple materials and engravings, but are still not talisman. Wow. Yeah. It's like you can start. It's yeah, it's really it's interesting. And then. You have most amulets are like protective amulets usually, but then like with that vulture's beak thing, there's also specifically procuring amulets where they, Mm. if you use them, they procure things like riches and nobility. Um, So yeah, we usually are talking about amulets and protection, but you can make a specific amulet for procuring and attracting things. So one example, also gross example, is wearing (laughs) the brain and heart of a peacock would procure grace and love for the person wearing it. See, okay, here's the thing. (laughs) Like, where's where's the science behind that? Because, like, is it only because we all view peacocks as graceful and beautiful? It's because of the, that's the only reason. 
that is the main re- there's a that is one of the main reasons so like one of in like there's a section of this book that does kind of like kind of dive into like how people chose what animals mm. or plants to use for certain things and a lot of times with the animals it was about the mythology around them okay so great. it is really more about the symbolism like in your culture like your talisman if you're in one part of the world for grace and love might be different because you might not mm-hmm. have peacocks so mm. whatever the equivalent you would use that it's, it's very like we've kind of talked about this depending on what region a culture was in those plants those animals that like nature setting is really what defines what things were holy to them and what they each meant mm. whereas like oh otters might not mean anything to me if i grow up in alaska <laughs> I don't know, we you have know, otters I don't know. montana Great. You have otters in Montana. It's like if I grow up in a completely different area of the world where there aren't otters, but yeah. I have, you know, chimpanzees, monkeys are going to be way more prevalent in my culture. So that's literally true. that. It's literally okay. the mythology behind the plants and animals and what they meant to the culture is how they mm. decided like what was used. That makes sense. It's all about intention. Yeah. Yes, definitely. It really, honestly, it kind of comes down to it. I feel like yeah. we got to do like a chaos magic episode at some point. Cause I mean, should we do it? We should. We should, we should do it. We should definitely do it. <laughs> um, so the weird part is that at some point, amulets start to cross into talisman territory. So this one example that we have is that there's like, oh, it like there's a book, another book. There's so many books on amulets. Like there's mm-hmm. just lists of them. Yeah. But one example is that a topaz carved with a falcon will give you grace, benevolence, love, and nobility to the person carrying it. So it's still considered an amulet, though, because the main difference between this, like an engraving on this stone, is that like you could just do this at any time of day. You could just like, I could just pick up this topaz and go engrave it, and now I've got myself an amulet. Mm. But it's really like the ritual and getting super specific about time things are made, like if it's associated with certain zodiacs, and things like that that starts to make it a talisman it's like yeah that's way more intentional yeah which you're gonna get into (laughs) yeah for sure uh one thing that i didn't have time to do but i thought would be fun is if we played like the game like amulet or talisman (laughs) that would be a very fun game yes yeah so a talisman is like an incantation a magical written spell but depending on the gig, you either tote it or not. It's kind of a personal thing that's got to sync up with everything about the person that it's meant for. Uh, that's why the stars and planets get on in on the action and we incorpor- incorporate astrology into it. Uh, craft a talisman based on like their planetary vibe and it's good to go. You can even pass it around like a magical baton, especially using a wax impression. So fun fact, a talisman is basically another way of saying seal or sigillum if you're feeling fancy. But back in the Middle Ages, families were keeping a hold of these objects like they were the keys to well-being and prosperity. That kind of makes sense. Everybody, every like noble family had like a seal. Yeah, or exactly. A sigil. And we found like old ones. I was I was doing some Googling this morning before, <laughs> before we started recording. And like we found in, I think it was in Turkey, he, we found like a pile of like 600 amulets whoa to that's Jupiter. crazy whoa. the storm got yeah and it's one of those they're like this is a this is giant they're like this is a lot of amulets and it ranged from things like stones and carved things to seals and and just like everything everything that's possible. crazy just, just i wonder what was going on trip. there was it like a store that would be funny you're like this is the <laughs> store for jupiter's amulets <laughs> That's hilarious. I believe it. Okay, so summon up in plain talk, an amulet is like your bodyguard, mainly for protection. But a talisman, while it also throws in some protection, is more about creating or bringing something to the table. In the first case, it's all about the material. In the second, it's the whole, like, ritual vibe. But, you know, reality is a little bit tricky here. These descriptions might sound spot on, but in the real world, things can get a bit fuzzier. Uh, In modern times, talismans has kind of become, like, just a catch-all term for any magical thing which is kind of rough too. But back in the ancient days, they were all about using amulets and talisman in medicine. There's like so many examples of this we could use, but even Pliny the Elder, that old sage, has some wild remedies too. And he was like, yo, if you snag a tick from a dog's left ear and slap it on an amulet, bam, no more pains. Uh. (laughs) 
I don't know if I want to be carrying chicks around. <laughs> yeah, no, I think you're in. If you do that, you're in for a lot of pains. Mm-hmm. So many pains. <laughs> so many pains. But he even says toothaches can be cured by wearing a tooth from a living mole. Yeah, that's a fun one. And then check this out. Wear a fox tongue on a bracelet and you're apparently bulletproof when it comes to eye problems. <laughs> mm. <laughs> it's it's a lot so of animal funny. cruelty happening in some of these. <laughs> it's really true. But magicians back then were even dropping wisdom like put on a hare's heart before a fever hits. And so just like overall classic moves, right? Mm, just what I would. That's my, where my thought goes immediately. Um, in reading some of these examples, you can really tell what were very common problems across society by what things the spells or amulets focused on. Yeah. There were a lot, there were a lot of amulets and talisman that were meant to protect you from basically knife wounds. Yes. Like stabbing was clearly an issue. Like when you think about it, you're like, why are there so many talisman that are like, if you swallow this, you won't get stabbed by a sword. If you eat this or carry that, you won't get stabbed. And you're like, <laughs> what? How you're often like, is how stabbing? Often, how often are people getting stabbed? Which is like, <laughs> clearly so it's a funny. big problem. Yes, yeah, seriously. Like, clearly people were out there just like dueling and getting shanked. And <laughs> That's true. Yeah. Ooh. That's so funny. Yeah. And you could probably do like the same thing today. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Like, uh, what? What would like look do? at like what people are like putting spells and rituals out for, and you're like, clearly this is a big issue, like right now. Yeah, it's exactly. Across like the collective well, like, mentality. When you think of it, like everybody was going to war back then, so you know, knife wounds, sword wounds, swords, <laughs> swords. Yeah, jeez, mm -hmm. we don't really have that problem anymore, thank God. But uh, the last point I wanted to hit on is like. <laughs> is like the astrological element to all this because it's like a pretty important aspect to really understand everything that goes into creating one of these items of protection. Which like apparently astrology, at least in the book we read, astrology really was like the third element that you really had to infuse all this with. It was pretty big deal when you're talking about amulets and talismans. Uh, whether like what they're representing or like on the days or times of the year that you create them. Like, etc., etc. <laughs> so check this out. According to Claudius Galen, who was Marcus Aurelius's doctor back in the day, which just let's just again, dream job. Like, what's up with all these dudes that like have like three really cool things that they make their money off of? Anyways, the zodiac signs roll with the elements in groups of three. Uh, like Aries, Leo, and Sagittarius are fire, Taurus, Virgo, and Capricorn on Earth, and so on. And they've got a gig with like the four humors in the body, which the humors are apparently like blood, phlegm, yellow bile, and like black bile or melancholia. Uh, apparently this is, you know, what the, how they talked back in the day. I don't know. But each zodiac trio has a vibe to it. Uh, like the first is hot and dry, the second is cold and dry, third and is hot and moist, and the last cold and moist. So they're all connected to like the zodiacs, like dealios, you know. And so basically, they're like the bosses of different kinds of body fluids, <laughs> which is news to me. That's kind of fun. So here's where it gets really interesting. If your humors are acting up and making you sick, you turn to the zodiac sign that matches your symptom. It's like your astrological medicine. And people back then would whip up remedies in the forms of like charms and amulets. Uh, Rene of Anjou had a whole stash of these medals, which was kind of like a collector's dream. I imagine like her stash is similar to like that Jupiter's storm store we talked about earlier. Like, oh my God, all the amulets. Yeah, I was thinking um, Little Mermaid and her yes. cavern of treasures. <laughs> so good that was, that's where my <laughs> mind went where she's just like look at this stuff isn't it neat and she's just like got all of it <laughs> that's um, hilarious i hope renee is actually a woman i don't know if this is the masculine or male you know or, or feminine hey, truly truly if we had that linguini around yeah, we, we could yeah, really that, figure that would, out we would know we would know um, yeah, so humors uh, are not a thing anymore. Just for anybody who hasn't heard of humors, it was before we understood germs and germ theory. So the 
model that we were kind of basing all of our medicine and and health advice off of was this idea that we think that there's these four main bodily fluids as Ruth listed. And if they were out of balance, that is what would dictate what kind of like help you needed. Like, oh, if you have too much black bile, you might have depression or you might experience <laughs> these things. So we have to like do some wacky thing to try and get them back in balance. But it's not real. So it doesn't, it's not a thing anymore <laughs> um, <laughs> because we discovered germs and microbes and now we understand how diseases work. But yeah, it yeah. used to be my humors. My humors are out of sorts. It's just so much fancier. I wish we still had like something of the equivalent today. It's now it's just like, uh, my back. My back that takes hurt. Some Advil. So there's another cool example in the sacred book of Hermes to Asclepius. Didn't you say something about Asclepius earlier? I don't think I did, but I think everyone might recognize as if I remember correctly, Asclepius, I think we've mentioned him because oh. he's he's like the god of medicine. <laughs> oh, yes. There is like an actual like that's like, oh, he's the hero and god of medicine in ancient Greek religion and, mytho and mythology. So, um, yeah, is this like Hermes to Asclepius? So maybe like Hermes was like writing this to the god of medicine, potentially. Yes, but that's probably what's going on here. Book. But yes, he's a he's a Greek god. Greek god. Uh, isn't Apollo his daddy? Oh, is he? Oh, yeah. Yeah, he is the son of Apollo. And you'd probably recognize, um, like, his, one of his symbols is a snake intertwined around a staff, which is sometimes used oh, still. Oh, yeah, in, that's like, the whole medicine. thing of it. Yeah, that's yeah. all medicine is all the, about yeah. that friggin' little symbol there. You've got Cool. Yeah, so it, it go, that, that little symbol, if you look up, like, the rod of Asclepius, you've probably seen it on, like, medical buildings or somewhere and that comes from the greek god asclepius because he is the god of medicine cool that's fun it says each the book basically it says each zodiac sign rules over a specific body part and can cause trouble in the surrounding areas so if you want to dodge that mess carve the zodiac signs their characters and the plants they dig on into a stone and wear that stone like bling and bam, you've got yourself a powerful remedy for the body. It's like uh, ancient astro bling for your health. <laughs> astro bling for health. Ruth, I feel like you have been in marketing too long because this is sounding really appealing to me now. <laughs> right? I know. It seems legit, doesn't it? So for it seems your health. like something I could sell nowadays to some suckers. Oh, no. Oh, you're starting to sound like Pliny the Elder there, man. I know. <laughs> So, uh -huh. all right, now you've got the lowdown on, like, what folks in the past thought about amulets and talismans, their ideas, beliefs, and all the good stuff that lays the foundation for the subject's history. Uh, this info is, like, the key to the next part of the pod, where we dive into some of the world of, like, learned or high magic and, like, how they actually crafted some of these things. But here's the cool part. It's going to clear up some of the mystery, or to be precise, the myths around this topic. And there's been a ton of nonsense written by those gosh darn snake oil salesmen. It's time to cut through that and actually figure out what makes a talisman. So let the magic crafting begin. I think it's just chaos magic, man. I think yeah, there's too many sense. rules here. I think there's too many rules. That's what I'm reading. I'm reading a lot of rules and I don't like it. <laughs> it's right. That's right, man. Um, well, I didn't... Uh, well, be sure to subscribe... So like and subscribe. Like and subscribe. <laughs> we need you to do this to find new fans. And that's you'd like that. Other, if you'd like other people to hear us mispronounce ancient Latin terms and right? other words from many cultures, <laughs> even modern day words, even just English ones, <laughs> which right? clearly we need help. If you're into that, then send us to a friend. Okay, yes. cool. Uh, see you later. Okay, bye.